This is part 7 of Dimensions, a casebook of alien contact. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please listen with an open mind. In the past 20 years, UFO reports have been studied by serious persons who have tried to place them within the framework of space science, modern physics, psychology, or the history of superstition. Superficially, the most appealing of the theories proposed is the extraterrestrial theory which would regard the UFOs as probes from another planet. Yet it falls short of explaining the phenomena in their historical development. Present-day saucers cannot be evaluated without reference to the 1897 airship or to earlier sighting of similar objects. Then, too, the theory of simple visitation must be compared with the assumption that the visitors know far more physics than we do, so much more, in fact, that an interpretation in terms of physical concepts known to us is bound to end in failure and contradiction. A second major flaw in all the theories proposed so far is found in the description of the entities and their behavior. As we will see below, any theory can account for some of these reports, but only at the expense of arbitrary rejection of a much larger group. To put it bluntly, the UFO phenomenon does not give evidence of being extraterrestrial at all. Instead it appears to be interdimensional and to manipulate physical realities outside of our own space-time continuum. October 12, 1963. Between Monte Maíz and Isla Verde, in Argentina, Eugenio Douglas drove his truck loaded with coal through the hard rain. Dawn was coming. Suddenly, Douglas saw a bright spot on the road ahead, like the headlights of an approaching vehicle, except that it was a single, blinding light. To avoid a collision, Douglas slowed down. The light became so intense he had to lower his head and move to the side. He stopped the truck and got out. The light had disappeared. Through the rain, Eugenio Douglas could now see a circular metallic craft, about 35 feet high. An opening became visible, making a second area of light, less intense, and three figures appeared. They looked like men, but they were wearing strange headdresses with things like antennae attached. They were over 12 feet tall. There was nothing repulsive about the entities, said Douglas but he was terribly scared. As soon as he was seen by the figures, a ray of red light flashed to the spot where he stood and burned him. Grabbing a revolver, he fired at the three entities and ran off toward Monte Maís. But the burning red light followed him as far as the village, where it interfered with the street lights, turning them violet and green. Douglas could smell a pungent gas. The beauty and dramatic character of that scene is impressive. In a screen illustration of the UFO saga this is probably the sighting that would best carry its total meaning. Douglas ran to the nearest house and shouted for help. Ribas, the owner, had died the previous night, but his family, gathered around the body, reported that at the same time they heard Douglas's call the candles in the room and the electric lights in the house turned green, and the same strange smell was noticed. They rushed to open the door, there was Douglas in the pouring rain, his overcoat over his head and a gun in his hand. The street lights had changed color. It must have been one of the most visually fantastic scenes in the rich archives of ufology. Eugenio Douglas was taken to the police station, where the burns on his face and hands were clearly seen. The police, it turned out, had received a number of calls about the lights color change, but they had attributed the change to irregularities in the local power plant, which, however, would hardly account for the change in the candle lights. Douglas was examined by a doctor, who stated that the burns had been caused by a radiation similar to ultraviolet, according to Douglas, he had felt a burn when exposed to a red beam. When villagers went to the site where the truck was still parked, they found large footprints, nearly 20 inches long, but they were shortly afterward washed away by rain. In late August 1963 near the town of Sagrada Familia, Brazil, Three boys, Fernando Eustagio, 11, his brother Ronaldo, 9, and a neighbor named Marcos, went into the Eustagio garden and started to draw water from the well. Suddenly they became aware of a hovering sphere above the trees. They could even see four or five rows of people inside the sphere. An opening under the sphere became visible, and two light rays shot downward. A slender, 10-foot tall being came down, as if gliding on the two beams of light. He alighted in the garden and walked for twenty feet or so in an odd fashion, his back seemed stiff, his legs were open, 
and his arms outstretched. He swung his body from left to right as if trying to find his balance and then sat down in a rock. The three boys observed that the giant wore a transparent helmet and had in the middle of his forehead what they described as a dark eye. He wore tall boots, each of which was equipped with a strange triangular spike, which made a peculiar impression in the soft ground and could be seen for several days afterward. His garment was shiny and had inflated as soon as the entity had touched the ground. The trousers seemed to be fastened tightly to the boots. He had a peculiar square pack on his chest, which emitted flashes of light intermittently. Inside the sphere, still hanging motionless above the garden, the three boys could see occupants behind control panels turning knobs and flicking switches. When the giant in the garden made a motion as if to grab one of the boys, Fernando picked up a stone, only to find himself unable to do anything with it as the spaceman looked straight into his eyes. The giant then returned to the sphere, still using the light beams as an elevator but holding his arms close to his body this time. The boys were no longer afraid, although they could not account for this change in their feeling. As the sphere left, they were sure the giant spaceman had not come to hurt them, and somehow, in the same irrational fashion, they knew he would come back again. In Brazil, six years earlier, an incident gained the place in UFO literature it certainly deserves thanks to an excellent investigation by the late Professor Olavo Fontes of the National School of Medicine in Rio de Janeiro. He interviewed and examined the witness, Antonio Vias Boas, of São Francisco de Sales, Minas Gerais. On the night of October 5, 1957, Antonio and his brother went to bed about 11 p.m. The night was hot, and as he opened the window Antonio saw a silvery light in the corral similar to the spot made by a powerful searchlight. Later that night, the two brothers observed the light was still there. Then it moved toward the house, sweeping the roof before going away. About 10 p.m. on October 14, Antonio was plowing with his tractor when he saw a blinding white light at the northern end of the field. Every time he tried to approach it, the light moved away. This happened about 20 times, though the light always appeared to wait for him. His second brother was watching the scene as Antonio finally gave up. The light simply vanished. The next evening, Antonio was alone at the same spot. The night was cold, clear, and starry. At 1 a.m. he saw something like a red star, which grew larger and became an egg-like, bright object that hovered above his tractor, then landed softly. Antonio tried to drive away, but the engine of the tractor died. He jumped down and took two steps, but someone caught his arm. After a short struggle, Four men carried him inside the craft. The beings communicated among themselves in slowly emitted growls, unlike any sound the witness could reproduce, although they were neither high-pitched nor too low. In spite of his resistance, the creature stripped him, washed his body with something like a wet sponge, and took him into another room through a strangely lettered door. It is not my purpose here to record all the details of the experience reported by Vias Boas, they have been adequately documented by Fontes and Creighton and later by the Lorenzans, who provided a complete reprint of the testimony, along with the professional opinion of Dr. Fontes after his medical examination of the witness, in their book Flying Saucer Occupants. Antonio remained alone in the room for what seemed a very long time. When he heard a noise at the door, he turned and received a terrible shock, the door was open, and a woman as naked as he was came in. Her hair was blonde, with a part in the center. She had blue eyes, rather longer than round, slanted outward. Her nose was straight, her cheekbones prominent. Her face looked very wide, wider than that of an Indio native. It ended in a pointed chin. Her lips were very thin, nearly invisible. Her ears were small but ordinary. She was much shorter than he was, her head only reaching his shoulder. She quickly made clear to him what the purpose of her visit was. Soon after the sexual episode, a man came in and beckoned to the woman, who, pointing to her belly, smiled, pointed at the sky, and followed the man out. The men came back with Antonio's clothes, then took him to a room where the other crew members were sitting, growling among themselves. The witness, who felt sure no harm would come to him now, carefully observed his surroundings. Among other things, all his remarks here are of interest, 
he noticed a box with a glass top that had the appearance of an alarm clock. The clock had one hand and several marks that would correspond to the three, six, nine, and twelve of an ordinary clock. However, although time passed, the hand did not move, and Antonio concluded that it was no clock. The symbolism in this remark by Vias Boas is clear. We are reminded of the tales quoted above, of the country where time does not pass, and of that great poet who had in his room a huge white clock without hands, bearing the words it is later than you think. Indeed, it is the poetic quality of such details in many UFO sightings that catches the attention, in spite of the irrational, or obviously absurd, character of the tale, and makes them so similar to a dream. Antonio must have though so, because he reflected that he must bring some evidence back and tried to steal the clock. At once, one of the men shoved him to the side angrily. This attempt to secure evidence is a constant feature of fairy tales, and we are also reminded of the efforts by Betty Hill to convince her captors to let her take a peculiar book she saw inside their craft. As in the Vias Boas incident, the men denied her the opportunity to convince the world that the experience had been real. She also observed a strange map that we will discuss in a later chapter, at last, one of the men motioned Antonio to follow him to a circular platform. He was then given a detailed tour of the machine, taken to a metal ladder, and signaled to go down. Antonio watched all the details of the preparation for takeoff and observed the craft as it rose and flew away in a matter of seconds. He noticed that the time was 5.30 a.m. He had spent over four hours inside the strange machine. It must be noted that the witness volunteered information about the sighting in general terms when a notice appeared in a newspaper calling for UFO reports. He was extremely reluctant to discuss the more personal aspects of his experience and related them only when questioned with insistence by Fontes. Like Maurice Mass, Vias Boas suffered from excessive sleepiness for about a month after the incident. The Sexual Episodes When folklore becomes degraded to a minor literary form, as the fairy faith was degraded to the fairy tales we know today, it naturally loses much of its content, precisely those adult details that cannot be allowed to remain in children's books. The direct result of the censorship of spicy details in these marvelous stories is that they become mere occasions for amazement. The Vias Boas case is hardly appropriate for nursery school reading, but to eliminate the woman from the story would turn it into a tale without deep symbolic or psychological value. The sexual context is precisely what gives such accounts their significance and their impact. The sexual, and, in some cases mentioned by Bud Hopkins, the sadomasochistic, component of the abduction stories provides an emotional encoding that makes them unforgettable. Without the sexual context, without the stories of changelings, human midwives, intermarriage with the gentry, of which we never hear in modern fairy tales, it is doubtful that the tradition about fairies would have survived through the ages. Nor is that true only of fairies, the most remarkable cases of sexual contact with non-humans are not found in spicy saucer books, nor in fairy legends, they rest, safely stored away, in the archives of the Catholic Church. To find them, one must first learn Latin and gain entrance into the few libraries where these unique records are preserved. But the accounts one finds there make the Vias Boas case and contemporary UFO books pale by comparison, as I believe the reader will agree before the end of this chapter. Let us first establish clearly that the belief in the possibility of intermarriage between human and non-human races is a corollary to the apparitions in all historical contexts. This is so obvious in biblical stories that I hardly need elaborate. The sex of the angels is the clearest of all theological questions. In Anatole France's novel Revolt of the Angels it is Arcade, one of the celestial beings, who says to a young Frenchman named Maurice who accuses him of stealing his girlfriend, there's nothing like having sound references. In order to assure yourself that I am not deceiving you, Maurice, on this subject of the amorous embraces of angels and women, look up Justin, Apologies 1 and 2, Flavius Josephus, Jewish Antiquities, Book I, Chapter 3, Athenagoras, Concerning the Resurrection, Lactantius, Book 2, Chapter 15, Tertullian, On the Veil of the Virgins, Marcus of Ephesus in Cellus, Eusebius, Propartio Evangelica, Book V, Chapter 4, Saint Ambrose, in his book on Noah and the Ark, Chapter 5, 
St. Augustine in his City of God, Book 15, Chapter 23, Father Melnet, the Jesuit, Treatise on Demons, page 248. Thus took Arcade, his guardian angel, to poor Maurice, as he tried to apologize for having stolen his mistress, pretty Madame Gilbert. And he added shamelessly, it was bound to be so, all the other angels in revolt would have done as I did with Gilbert. Women, saith the apostle, should pray with their heads covered, because of the angels. This is clear enough. But fairies and elves? Are they subject to such carnal desires? Consider the following facts. In the preface of the saga of Rolf, Torfus, a 17th century Danish historian, record statements made about the elves by Einar Gsmund, the Icelandic scholar, I am convinced they really do exist, and they are creatures of God, that they get married like we do, and have children of either sex, we have proof of this in what we know of the love of some of their women with simple mortals. William Grant Stewart, in the popular superstitions and festive amusements of the Highlanders of Scotland, devotes the second part of his discussion to the same problem. In a chapter entitled Of the Passions and Propensities of the Fairies, he has this to say on sexual intercourse with them, the fairies are remarkable for the amorousness of their dispositions, and are not very backward in forming attachments and connections with a people that cannot with propriety be called their own species. This is a beautiful example of convoluted phraseology. Stewart is less obviously embarrassed when he reports that such events no longer seem to take place between people and fairies. We owe it, in justice to both the human and the fairy communities of the present day, to say, that such intercourse as that described to have taken place betwixt them is now extremely rare, with the single exception of a good old shoemaker, now or lately living in the village of Tamantul, who confesses having had some dalliances with Alan and she in his younger days, we do not know personally anyone who has carried matters this length. If Stuart came back today, he would have to revise this statement after reading UFO material. Reverend Kirk stated the case more clearly when he said, in our Scotland there are numerous and beautiful creatures of that aerial order, who frequently assign meetings to lascivious young men of succubi, or as joyous mistresses and prostitutes, who are called Leon and Sith or familiar spirits. I hardly need to remind the reader of the importance of such familiar spirits in medieval occultism, particularly in Rosicrucian theories. Nor do I need to mention the number of accused witches who were condemned to death on the evidence that they had such familiar spirits. Like the modern abductees examined by Bud Hopkins, the women accused of witchcraft usually had a strange mark or scar somewhere on their body. There is no gap between the fairy faith and ufology regarding the sexual question. This is apparent from the study made by Evans Wentz, who records the following story, My grandmother Catherine McInnes used to tell about a man named Lachlan, whom she knew, being in love with a fairy woman. The fairy woman made it a point to see Lachlan every night, and he being worn out with her began to fear her. Things got so bad at last that he decided to go to America to escape the fairy woman. As soon as the plan was fixed and he was about to emigrate, women who were milking at sunset out in the meadows heard very audibly the fairy woman singing this song, What will the brown-haired woman do when Lockie is on the billows? Lockie emigrated to Cape Breton, landing at Picshu, Nova Scotia, and in his first letter home to his friends he stated that the same fairy woman was haunting him there in America. The comments by Evans Wentz on this case are important, to discover a tale so rare and curious as this, is certainly of all our evidence highly interesting. And aside from its high literary value, it proves conclusively that the fairy women who entice mortals to their love in modern times are much the same, if not the same, as the succubi of Middle Age mystics. This allows us to return to the religious records mentioned above, which offer some of the most remarkable cases of apparition I have ever come across. It is difficult to believe that stories exist that surpass, for their amazing contents or shocking features, some of the reports we have already studied, such as the Hills case or the Vias Boas report. But, remarkable as they are, these latter two accounts refer only to one aspect of the total phenomenon, they can be interpreted only after being placed within the continuum of hundreds of lesser known cases, which provide the necessary background. A book by Isidore Lisu, attributed by him to a theologian named Sinistrari, 
shows that church scholars were as puzzled by reports of incubi and succubi as most modern students of UFO lore are by the Villas-Boas case. Observing that the fundamental text of the church gave no clear opinion on such cases, the author wondered how they should be judged by religious law. There are numerous cases in the records of the church, especially in which trials, in which intercourse with incubi is found. From the church's point of view, this raises several problems. First, how is such intercourse physically possible? Second, how does demoniality differ from bestiality? Third, what sin is committed by those who engage in such intercourse? Fourth, what should their punishment be? The earliest author who uses the word demonialitis is J. Caramuel, in his Theologia Fundamentalis. Before him, no one made a distinction between demoniality and bestiality. All the moralists, following St. Thomas Aquinas, understood by bestiality any kind of carnal intercourse with an object of a different species. Thus Cayetan in his commentary on St. Thomas places intercourse with the demon in the class of bestiality, and so does Sylvester when he defines Luxuria, and Bonacena in De Matrimonio. In this respect, Vias Boas's remark that lying with a woman gave him the impression he was lying with an animal, because of her growls, is striking. On this fine point of theology Sinistrari concludes that St. Thomas never meant intercourse with demons to fall within his definition of bestiality. By different species, Sinistrari says, the saint can only mean species of living beings, and this hardly applies to the devil. Similarly, if a man copulates with a corpse, this is not bestiality, especially according to the Thomas doctrine that denies a corpse the nature of the human body. The same would be true for a man who copulates with the corpse of an animal. It is quite fascinating to follow Sinistrari's thoughts in an area that is directly relevant to UFO reports. Gios Boas would certainly have had a hard time before the Inquisitors if he had lived in an earlier age. Indeed, a man named Benoit de Bern, who confessed at age 75 that he had had intercourse for 40 years with a succuba named Mermline, was condemned and burned alive. The act of love, writes Zinastrari, has for its object human generation. Unnatural semination, that is, intercourse that cannot be followed by generation, constitutes a sin against nature. But it is the subject of that semination that distinguishes the various sins under that type. If demoniality and bestiality were in the same category, a man who had copulated with a demon could simply tell his confessor, I have committed the sin of bestiality. And yet he obviously has not committed that sin. Considerable problems arose when one had to identify the physical process of intercourse with demons. This is clearly a most difficult point, as difficult as that of identifying the physical nature of flying saucers, and Sinistrari gives a remarkable discussion of it. Pointing out that the main object of the discussion is to determine the degree of punishment these sins deserve, he tries to list all the different ways in which the sin of demoniality can be committed. First he remarks, there are quite a few people, overinflated with their little knowledge, who dare deny what the wisest authors have written, and what everyday experience demonstrates, namely, that the demon, either incubus or succubus, has carnal union not only with men and women but also with animals. Sinistrari does not deny that some young women often have visions and imagine that they have attended a Sabbath. Similarly, ordinary erotic dreams have been classified by the church quite separately from the question we are studying. Sinistrari does not mean such psychological phenomena when he speaks of demoniality, he refers to actual physical intercourse, such as the basic text on witchcraft discuss. Thus in the Compendium Maleficarum, Naxius gives 18 case histories of witches who have had carnal contact with demons. All cases are vouched for by scholars whose testimony is above question. Besides, St. Augustine himself says in no uncertain terms, it is a widespread opinion, confirmed by direct or indirect testimony of trustworthy persons, that the sylvans and fauns, commonly called incubi, have often tormented women, solicited and obtained intercourse with them. There are even demons, which are called disses, i.e., luton, by the Gauls, who are quite frequently using such impure practices, this is vouched for by so numerous and so high authorities that it would be impudent to deny it. Now the devil makes use of two ways in these carnal contacts. One he uses with sorcerers and witches, the other with men and women perfectly foreign to witchcraft, 
What Sinistrari is saying here is that two kinds of people may come in contact with the beings he calls demons, those who have made a formal pact with them, and he gives the details of the process for making this pact, and those who simply happen to be contacted by them. The implications of this fundamental statement of occultism for the interpretation of the fairy faith and of modern UFO stories should be obvious. The devil does not have a body. Then how does he manage to have intercourse with men and women? How can women have children from such unions? The theologians answer that the devil borrows the corpse of a human being, either male or female, or else he forms with other materials a new body for this purpose. Indeed, we find here the same theory as that expressed by one of the gentry and quoted by Evans Wentz, we can make the old young, the big small, the small big. The devil then is said to proceed in one of two ways. Either he first takes the form of a female succubus and then has intercourse with a man, or else the succubus induces lascivious dreams in a sleeping man and makes use of the resulting pollution to allow the devil to perform the second part of the operation. This is the theory taught by Naxius, who gives a great number of examples. Likewise, Hector Boethius, in Historia Scotorum, documents the case of a young Scot who, for several months, was visited in his bedroom, the windows and doors of which were closed, by a succuba of the most ravishing beauty. She did everything she could to obtain intercourse with him, but he did not yield to her caresses and entreaties. One point intrigued Sinistrari greatly, such demons do not obey the exorcists and have no fear of relics and other holy objects, thus, they do not fall into the same category as the devils by which people are possessed. But then, are they really creatures of the devil? Should not we place them in a separate category, with the elves and the elementals they so closely resemble? And then, if such creatures have their own bodies, does the traditional theory, that incubi and succubi are demons who have borrowed human corpses, hold? Could it explain how children are born from such unions? What are the physical characters of such children? Can we agree with Lebrun when he writes, if the body of these children is thus different from the bodies of other children, their soul will certainly have qualities that will not be common to others, that is why Cardinal Bayermond thinks Antichrist will be born of a woman having had intercourse with an incubus. If we admit that the UFO reports quoted earlier in this chapter indicate the phenomenon has genetic contents, then the above questions are fundamental, and it is important to see how tradition understood them. According to Sinistrari, to theologians and philosophers, it is a fact, that from the copulation of humans, men or women, with the demon, human beings are sometimes born. It is by this process that Antichrist must be born, according to a number of doctors. Besides, they observe that as the result of a quite natural cause, the children generated in this manner by the incubi are tall, very strong, very daring, very magnificent and very wicked. The literature thus mentions as possible sons of the demon a list of historical figures that ranges from Plato and Alexander to Caesar, Merlin, and even that damned Herziarch whose name is Martin Luther. Sinistrari disagrees with this theory, in spite of all the respect I owe so many great doctors, I do not see how their opinion can stand examination. Indeed, as Pererius observes very well in Commentary on Genesis, Chapter 6, all the strength, all the power of the human sperm, comes from spirits that evaporate and vanish as soon as they issue from the genital cavities where they were warmly stored. The physicians agree on this. Therefore, it is not possible for the demon to keep the sperm he has received in a sufficient state of integrity to produce generation, for, no matter what the vessel where he could attempt to keep it is, this vessel would have to have a temperature equal to the natural temperature of human genital organs, which is found nowhere but in those same organs. Now, in a vessel where the warmth is not natural, but artificial, spirits are resolved, and no generation is possible. We also read in the scriptures, Genesis 6-4, that giants were born as a result of intercourse between the sons of God and the daughters of man, this is the very letter of the sacred text. Now, these giants were men of tall stature, as it is said in Baruch 3-26, and far superior to other men. Besides their monstrous size, they called attention by their strength, their plunders, their tyranny. And it is to the crimes of these giants that we must attribute the main and primary cause of the flood, according to Cornelius Alapidae in his commentary on Genesis. 
If the intercourse in question has given birth to beings of monstrous proportions, we must either not the ordinary intercourse of men with women but the operation of the incubi who, owing to their nature, can very well be called sons of God. This opinion is not in contradiction with that of Tertullian, according to whom these incubi could be angels who had allowed themselves to commit the sin of luxury with women. What we have here is a complete theory of contact between our race and another race, non-human, different in physical nature, but biologically compatible with us. Angels, demons, fairies, creatures from heaven, hell, or Magonia, they inspire our strangest dreams, shape our destinies, steal our desires. But who are they? 5. The celestial component, signs in heaven. Apparitions. They speak all the languages of the earth. They know all about the past and future of the human race, of any human being. This statement was made in 1968 by a Spanish clerk who claims he has been in contact with extraterrestrials since 1954. The inhabitants of Planet Wolf 424, sick, are among us in human form and with false identities. They are far superior to us and very peace-loving. I am in permanent contact with them. They either write to me or call me. We have meetings. How did he contact these allegedly superior entities? It seems that in 1954 a saucer threw a stone covered with hieroglyphics into the University Gardens, Madrid. Fernando Sesma copied these symbols down, and presto, two-way communication began. These absurd stories are the nucleus of many modern-day cults. In Great Britain, similar fantastic rumors are spreading. British scientists, some people claim, have been contacted by a mysterious source through radio and have become involved in undercover activities at the request of extraterrestrials. Some of these scientists have disappeared. Through such contacts, so the story goes, the extraterrestrials hope to control our history. For what purpose? I myself have received letters from individuals claiming to be members of secret organizations whose headquarters are, quite literally, out of this world. These correspondents informed me that the purpose of their group is to prevent mankind from reaching other worlds in space. Of course, other contactees make exactly opposite claims. The fact remains that irrational belief in non-human control of terrestrial destinies is as old as ordinary human politics. Thus, a Madrid newsman, Armando Puente, claims that Sesma warned him three months before Robert Kennedy's assassination that the senator would be killed. Sesma similarly predicted a wave of UFO sightings in Argentina, a much easier task. The same power attributed to saucer people was once the exclusive property of fairies. This was believed by ignorant medieval peasants and scholars as well. Thus, one of the first questions put to Joan of Arc by her inquisitors was if she had any knowledge or if she had not assisted at the assemblies held at the Fountain of the Fairies, near Domremy, around which dance malignant spirits. And another question and answer was thus recorded, asked whether she did not believe, prior to the present day, that fairies were malignant spirits, she, answered she did not know. Without reopening the entire problem of witchcraft, it is important to note the continuum of beliefs, which leads directly from primitive magic, through mystical experience, the fairy faith, and religion, to modern flying saucers. The study of witchcraft has shown these subjects to be closely interrelated. And while we are not concerned with individual beliefs in this chapter, we are interested in the social implications of such rumors, which are quite real whether the facts are true or false. The power of these apparitions can best be seen in some of the major miracles of history. At Knock, Ireland, in 1852, the witnesses beheld luminous beings, among them the Virgin, she held her hands extended apart and upward, in a position that none of the witnesses could have previously seen in any statue or picture, three witnesses reported noticing her bare feet. One woman, Bridget Trench, was so carried away by the sight that she fervently went to the apparitions to embrace the virgin's feet. But her arms closed on empty air. I felt nothing in the embrace but the wall, yet the figures appeared so full and so lifelike that I could not understand it and wondered why my hands could not feel what was so plain and distinct to my sight. Bridget also remarked how heavily the rain was then falling, but, she added, I felt the ground carefully with my hands, and it was perfectly dry. The wind was blowing from the south, right against the gable,
but no rain fell on that portion of the gable where the figures were. St. John was standing at an angle to the other figures. Dressed as a bishop, he held a large open book in his left hand. The fingers of his right hand were raised in a gesture of teaching. One of the witnesses, Patrick Hill, went close enough to see the lines and letters in the book. When the parish priest was told of the apparitions, he said it might be a reflection from the stained glass windows of the church and quietly spent the rest of the evening at home. The phenomenon lasted several hours. Their clothes soaked through, all the witnesses went home before midnight. The next morning nothing was left to be seen. Ten days after the incident, a deaf child was cured and a man born blind saw after his pilgrimage to knock. Soon seven or eight cures a week were reported, a dying man, so ill that he vomited blood most of the way while being carried to knock and received the last sacraments from the archdeacon on his arrival, was cured instantaneously after drinking some water in which a scrap of cement from the gable wall had been dissolved. All this came at an unfortunate time for the Catholic Church in Ireland. Most of Archdeacon Kavanaugh's fellow priests doubted and disapproved. The Knock Church had been built only fifty years earlier, when Irish Catholics had emerged from hiding, and much as in Lourdes and Fatima, the clergy tried at first not to get involved in the pilgrimages. Local and national papers were asked by the clergy to refrain from giving the apparition publicity, while papers hostile to Catholicism printed derisive articles about it. Attempts to explain the phenomenon by physical means were made. A science professor from Maynooth performed tests for the official commission of inquiry appointed by the Archbishop of Tuam. He used a magic lantern to project photographic images on the gable wall in the presence of twenty priests and testified that the tests ruled out the possibility that the apparition had been a product of a photographic hoax. A correspondent of the London Daily Telegraph made his own tests at a later date and reported that however the reported apparitions were caused, they could not have been due to a magic lantern. Many features in this report are identical to those in UFO phenomena, the strange globe of light of varying intensity, the luminous entities within or close to the light, the absence of rain at the site of the apparition, and, finally, the alleged miraculous cures. All these features are present in the current UFO lore in America. To those who have not closely followed the specialized UFO literature, the assertion that UFO sightings involve mysterious cures will come as a surprise. Take, for instance, the Damon, Texas, report of September 3, 1965, where a policeman was allegedly cured of a wound on his hand when exposed to the light from a hovering object. Or the Petra Police, Brazil, report of October 25, 1957, in which we are told that a girl dying from cancer was saved by a fantastic operation performed by two men who came from the sky. Or the case of Dr. X, the French doctor who observed two strange objects near his house in October 1968 and was subsequently cured of a large hematoma and of a form of paralysis. Clearly we are dealing here with a pattern reminiscent of medieval folklore. The Knock case is not the most remarkable instances of a similarity between religious apparitions and UFO sightings, a subject to which we will return in Chapter 7. And although it took place in Ireland, the miracle aspect is not the most reminiscent of the standard features of the fairy faith. An incident occurring at daybreak, on Saturday December 9, 1531, in Mexico, represents the culmination of everything we have discussed. Of tremendous sociological and psychological impact, it has left physical traces that can still be seen and, indeed, are still an object of devotion today. A 57-year-old Aztec Indian whose Nahuatl name was Singing Eagle and whose Spanish name was Juan Diego was walking to the church of Tlaltilalco, near Mexico City. Suddenly he froze in his tracks as he heard a concert of singing birds, sharp and sweet. The air was bitterly cold, no bird in its right mind would sing at such an hour, and yet the harmonious music went on, stopping abruptly. Then someone with a woman's voice called Juan Diego's name. The voice was coming from the top of the hill, which was hidden in a frosty mist, a brightening cloud. And when he climbed the hill, he saw her. As Ethel Cook Elliot writes in A Woman Clothed with the Sun, the sun wasn't above the horizon, yet one saw her as if against the sun because of the golden beams that rayed her person from head to feet. She was a young Mexican girl about fourteen years old and wonderfully beautiful. So far, 
We have a perfect beginning for a standard fairy apparition. But in the ensuing dialogue, Juan Diego was told that the girl was Mary and that she desired a temple at that particular place, so run now to Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, and tell the Lord Bishop all that you have seen and heard. This was easier to say than to accomplish. Poor Indians were not in the habit of going to the Spanish section of the city, and even less to the bishop's palace. Bravely, Juan ran down the mountain and begged the noble bishop, Don Fray Juan de Zamariga, to hear his story. Naturally, the bishop, although he was kind to the Indian, did not believe a word of his tale, so Juan went back through the mountains and met the lady a second time. He advised her to send the bishop a more suitable messenger, and he was quite blunt about it. Listen, little son, was the sharp answer. There are many I could send. But you are the one I have chosen for this task. So, tomorrow morning, go back to the bishop. Tell him it is the Virgin Mary who sends you, and repeat to him my great desire for a church in this place. The next morning, Juan Diego returned to Mexico City and met again with the patient bishop. Juan Diego was so adamant and seemed so honest in telling his story that Fray Juan de Zumariga was shaken. He told Juan to ask the apparition for a tangible sign, and he instructed two servants to follow the Indian and watch his actions. They tracked him through the city, observed that he spoke to no one, saw him climb the hills. And then he vanished. They searched the area without finding a trace of him. Again, the perfect fairy tale, but one had gone to the hill. He gave the apparition the bishop's answer, and she said, Very well, little son. Come back tomorrow at daybreak. I will give you a sign for him. You have taken much trouble on my account, and I shall reward you for it. Go in peace, and rest. The next morning, Juan did not come. His uncle, his only relative, was dying. Juan spent the day trying to relieve his sufferings and left him only on Tuesday, to get a priest. As he was running to Tlatilaco, the apparition again barred his way. Embarrassed, he told her why he had not followed her instructions, and she said, My little son, do not be distressed and afraid. Am I not here who am your mother? Are you not under my shadow and protection? Your uncle will not die at this time. This very moment his health is restored. There is no reason now for the errand you set out on, and you can peacefully attend to mine. Go up to the top of the hill, cut the flowers that are growing there and bring them to me. There were no flowers on the top of the hill, as Juan Diego knew very well. In the middle of December, there could be no flower there, and yet, upon reaching the place, he found Castilian roses, their petals wet with dew. He cut them and, using his long Indian cape, his tilma, to protect them from the bitter cold, carried them back to the apparition. She arranged the flowers he had dropped in the warp, then tied the lower corners of the tilma behind his neck so that none of the roses would fall. She advised him not to let anybody but the bishop see the sign she had given him and then disappeared. Juan Diego never met her again. At the bishop's palace several servants made fun of the Indian visionary. They pushed him around and tried to snatch the flowers. But when they observed how the roses seemed to dissolve when they reached for them, they were astonished and let him go. Juan was taken once more to the bishop. Juan Diego put up both hands and untied the corners of crude cloth behind his neck. The looped up fold of the tilma fell, the flowers he thought were the precious sign tumbled out and lay in an untidy heap on the floor. Alas for the virgin's careful arrangement. But Juan's confusion over this mishap was nothing to what he felt immediately after it. Inside of seconds the bishop had risen from his chair and was kneeling at Juan's feet, and inside of a minute all the other persons in the room had surged forward and were also kneeling. The bishop was kneeling before Juan's tilma, and, as Ethel Cook Elliot remarks, millions of people have knelt before it since, for it has been placed over the high altar in the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Mexico City. The tilma consists of two pieces, woven of maguey fibers and sewn together, measuring 66 by 41 inches. On this coarse material, whose color is that of unbleached linen, a lovely figure can be seen, 56 inches tall. Surrounded by golden rays, it emerges as from a shell of light, clear-cut and lovely in every detail of line and color. The head is bent slightly and very gracefully to the right, just avoiding the long seam. 
The eyes look downward, but the pupils are visible. This gives an unearthly impression of lovingness and lovableness. The mantle that covers the head and falls to the feet is greenish blue with a border of purest gold, and scattered through with golden stars. The tunic is rose-colored, patterned with a lace-like design of golden flowers. Below is a crescent moon, and beneath it appear the head and arms of a cherub. Juan's uncle was cured. As he was awaiting the priest, too weak even to drink the medicine his nephew had prepared, he saw his room suddenly filled with soft light. A luminous figure, that of a young woman, appeared near him. She told him he would get well and informed him of Juan Diego's mission. She also said, Call me and call my image Santa Maria de Guadalupe, or so the message was understood. In the six years that followed the incident, over eight million Indians were baptized. In recent times, some 1,500 persons still go to kneel before Juan Diego's Tilma every day. This case reminds us of several important aspects of the many tales of fairies we have reviewed, the mystious, sweet music announcing that the fairy draws near, the flowers, roses once again, that grow in an impossible place, and the sign given to the human messenger, which changes nature as he goes away, like the coals that change to gold given to human midwives by the gnomes, the numerous similar symbols found in countless tales. Indeed, we cannot help but recall here the word of Hartland in his Science of Fairy Tales, this gift of an object apparently worthless, which turns out, on the conditions being observed, of the utmost value, is a commonplace of fairy transactions. It is one of the most obvious manifestations of superhuman power. A final aspect is the cosmic symbolism, the crescent moon under the Virgin's feet, as in the lines of Revelation, and there appeared a great sign in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. This is the end of Dimensions, a casebook of Alien Contact Part 7. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please proceed to Part 8, before YouTube deletes it. Thank you for listening.